Hi everyone, I'm Charlotte. Today I'm presenting to you my senior design capstone project in the College of Engineering that I completed alongside my team members Kimberly Krupa and Lena Sabadusi. Together we created a soft robot for stable beating heart surgery for our client Tommaso Ranzani under our advisor William Hauser. Just to give you a little bit of context as to what we were actually working with as the design idea, rather than just jumping straight into what I was making, I wanted to first show you the parts of the heart that this would be sitting on. So I want to draw your attention to the image on the top, uh, which shows you just a schematic of the heart where it highlights the tricuspid valve. That tricuspid valve and the chordae tendineae that are attached to it are shown below in the moving image uh, so that you can see this pulsating motion. To mention that is really important, as you can tell from the title of this, I am working on something for stable beating heart surgery in that the robot that we're working with needs to be able to actually hold itself stable in this pumping environment and this beating motion that it's already uh, working against. This beating motion presents a lot of issues for rigid traditional robotics to be able to enter into the heart because any amount of jostling could potentially send it into a part of the tissue that it can tear, causing a ton more issues than you obviously want to be solving in that moment, especially if this is a surgical intervention. And for what we are looking to do, which I will once again explain in just a second, if you were to restrain a part of the heart as we're looking to with a less than compliant material, like a metal rather than a silicone, you have the potential of stalling the heart and causing a heart attack while you are operating. The tricuspid valve specifically, again, drawing attention to the bottom image, does this kind of pulsating motion as it allows blood through from the right atrium to the right ventricle. This pulsating motion is, of course, very important. It's stopping blood flow and letting it through in an oscillatory fashion. This can be disrupted, however, if the tricuspid valve were to dilate or get too large. This could potentially allow, allow too much blood to flow through or some blood to flow back up into the right uh, atrium, disrupting the oxygenation cycle within the heart, potentially causing weakening of the m muscles over time and inevitably heart failure at the end. Unfortunately, the way that you would have to deal, this current, deal with this current day is with heart surgery. It's kind of the only intervention option that exists. This is, of course, very complex, very risky for the patient, and requires a lot of recovery time after the traumatic surgery. Minimally invasive surgery is an ideal, uh, basically constructed around soft robotics, these small, compact, little devices that could be inserted with just a simple incision by a catheter rather than opening the entire chest cavity. The device that we'd be looking into, as you can see here, would be inserted with just a single catheter, either from an incision on the stomach or on the chest, to allow it to slip through either the superior uh, or inferior vena cava and get onto the tricuspid valve. This ultimately is a feasibility study. Oh, sorry for the font being way too large right there, but it's courtesy of the PI in charge of this. Um, this would ultimately be a feasibility study on this soft robotic device to see if it can work. We are the first people working on this and actually conceptualize it, bring this design from concept to fruition. It would again be inserted and removed just by a catheter. It would not be a permanent uh, inclusion into your heart from then on. It would only be there to suit the surgery as it is being performed. This device would have to be capable of expanding along the, tri uh, the chordae tendineae that are attached to the, tri the tricuspid valve, also known as the heart strings, and grasp onto them to hold on stably as the heart continues to pump while the surgery is being uh, done, and draw together those cords so that the dil dilation that is occurring can be stitched back closer together by the surgeon that is operating. So I wanted to show you some of the design concepts that we were considering, starting from what we initially were working with when the grant was originally written to what we're currently working with and what I'm presenting to you today is my final design. This is ultimately a pneumatic actuator, meaning that it takes in air to move. Actuation just means movement. Sorry if I've already said it without def defining that for you. Again, it's inserted just via one catheter, meaning that it, has, it can have multiple air inputs, but they would all need to have a common end. It would have to grasp onto the chordae tendineae, as I mentioned, that are attached to the tricuspid valve and restrain them a bit. And just for manufacturer's sake right now, we're working four times the scale of what would actually be inserted into your heart. So when I say that something moves seven inches, don't be concerned that wouldn't be inside of you. It would be much smaller. So the final design that I'll be presenting to you today is shown here in this schematic. Um, it involves two different gripping arms that are of the same shape, here denoted in blue. I will be calling them gripping arms because they are doing a gripping motion and would be used to grip onto the chordae tendineae of the heart. 
A green expansion actuator is shown in between those two gripping actuators to allow for a variable length to be used in case you want to grip closer to the chordae tendineae where they occur at the top of the valve cusp or all the way down to deal with what are called papillary muscles. And finally, the manipulation arms are shown in red. They're attached to the gripper arm furthest from the catheter input and would be used to, again, restrain the chordae tendineae or the papillary muscles to aid in the dilation or the removal of the dilation that is occurring. So just to get in a bit to the design concepts that we ran through, as this was a design project for me, uh, I first wanted to talk about the gripping direction, the actuation method of the silicone gripping arms that I will be talking about. Just to know in all of the pictures that look like this, basically, the darker of the two colors on all of the schematics represent the air chambers that exist within all of these devices. So. The way that air chambers work is also that air being input will always travel the path of least resistance. So where you see that something is closer to the wall, it will bend away from that wall. So we start manipulating that to get the desired motion that we want. We originally looked at either doing an above and below gripping action. We, after talking with collaborators, determined that a 360 grip would actually be more beneficial and have more probability of catching onto the chordae tendineae and holding on stably. Uh, to be able to do that, we would need a a variable resistance along each leg that we're considering. We considered doing it with teeth spacing, but that was kind of a manufacturing nightmare. What we actually wound up doing was something more like a tapered leg, where one side becomes thicker as it gets closer to the center. Here you can see that device working. Uh, on the right side is an actual moving image of what we took in the device that we're making. This uh, has a an air input through the bottom of it, so it's actually disrupting the 360 motion that we were expecting. If I were to show you, this is now actually me and not as pretty, so I didn't show it first. But you can see that once the air is being input through the center underneath the actuator, it does complete that 360 wraparound motion as expected and as desired. The extension actuator that would sit between two of the gripper actuators that I just showed you, again, sorry for the font issue that's happening here, would have to kind of bellow out like an accordion. That's how we always thought of it. The way that our lab currently works with it is by making those little balloon shapes that you see on the left side of the image. However, because we want all of these actuators to be able to act independent of each other, they each need their own pneumatic line running to them. That means basically because these lines have to slide between either being at their full length or all the way closed, we would need something that would allow for slippage through the center. That means that we needed to consider a hole through this balloon basically. We initially thought about doing a donut design and what we wound up doing was basically an amalgamation of both of those things where we have four bellows separated to allow for a common center to be placed within. And as you can see here, it's operating at around a seven inch uh, length scale. It's going from basically one centimeter to seven inches just by a little bit of air actuation. So it's working just as we want. It's very strong, can support the weight of the actuators that would be attached to it, and is ultimately doing exactly what we need it to do. Moving on to the manipulation arms that would sit on the front of the uh, device on one of the gripper arms attached. These would need to, again, just manipulate however the surgeon needs them to. Uh, so we were required to do two degrees of freedom for these, this part of the device. We considered either fiber reinforcements, again, just adding resistance along so that it would only bend in a gap where there wasn't a fiber, or doing a similar mold air chamber the way that we did for the last device, the silicone gripper actuator. That is basically what we wound up doing. So again, this is pulling away from the two thinnest walls and doing what I imagine as a wrist elbow motion so it can grasp onto something and pull it away, uh, ultimately doing the manipulation that we were expecting and wanting for this device to actually do. This is just a quick schematic to explain to you that all of the pneumatic lines are running uh, through that common center, as I mentioned before, of the expansion actuator and allowing each of these things to operate separately so that one of the gripper arms can go while the other one remains unactuated. You can then expand, manipulate along the way, et cetera. Uh, to talk about the feasibility, as again, this was a feasibility study. We have not yet performed it. We're performing it now. I'm missing it for this today, but it's fine. <laughs> However, if you come and see my uh, presentation for the capstone uh, project that I am presenting in the College of Engineering next Friday, May 3rd, in the Life and Science Building uh, in, at 1048, you can see us talk about it there. Um, that's really when you can hear about the whole of my project, and I really invite you all to come. It'll be like this, and there'll be a ton of other engineers. 
Um, finally, to talk about the future work that we expect from this project, we are working towards defining the movement of the manipulation arms more uh, towards what the surgeons are looking for, upping the complexity. Right now it does exactly what we wanted them to do, but because this actually is turning out to be very feasible, we're thinking about upping the complexity to do very specific actions through surgery. Uh, right now, the feasibility that we'd be considering is just whether or not this can support its own weight and grasp stably onto a beating environment using just rubber bands, basically, to look like chordae tendinae. We are considering it only in a gaseous environment, not in liquid flow, the way that it would be, obviously, in your beating heart. So that would be the next step in feasibility to make sure that this holds on stably while it's being introduced with a different kind of pressure. Uh, obviously scaling it down, we're not about to insert a device that goes this long into your chest, mm -hmm. so it needs to get back down. This is again four times the size it needed to be. And finally, the expansion actuator that we made was actually really exciting for the collaborator that we were working with, and we are thinking about potentially expanding it to not only expand in the vertical direction, but also in the horizontal, acting almost as a stent rather than the standard rigid metal stent that you could include, which I mentioned originally because it can jostle around and then rip into your heart. Not that good. So we're really excited for what will continue after we all leave, and I look forward to talking about this again at my project presentation in a week, if you would all come. But thank you for your time today, everyone. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. So is this kind of like, um, is, is it a multi-purpose tool? Like, can it fix a lot of different problems in the heart, or is it really designed just to do one thing? Right now, this would be, I mean, I don't know enough about the heart to tell you if this could do a ton of other things in the heart. The only way that we've been looking at it is for the tricuspid valve, but the operation of all of these uh, different actuators that are situated together and the processing of putting them all together is revolutionary enough that this could change the way that we start building other robots that work similarly for other parts of the, uh, for other parts of the heart or the body generally. Yeah, Kyle. When you scale it down, are you, would you hypothetically use the same materials that you used to make the larger model? Yes, you would. So all of these are compliant and uh, biocompatible. They will not hurt you, and they can obviously be within your body for the only a couple hours of surgery that this would require. Again, this is removing the possibility of open heart surgery, which would be much longer and much scarier. This would most likely take place with a camera also being inserted and a surgeon working on a da Vinci device, one of the robotic micro scale whatever devices, uh, which basically means that this would only be in for a shorter period of time than expected, and all of these can remain within the body without hurting. So uh, silicone would still be used for the gripper arms and the manipulation arms, and I don't know if I mentioned it, but it's just a thermoplastic that is doing the expansion in the actuator in, the, in between. Yeah, you. Yeah, does this fit up through one catheter? Yes, it would fit in one catheter. As of right now, again, it's four times the scale, so it definitely doesn't look like it. But when condensed, this is a side thing that I didn't even know and a thing that I didn't have to really consider through the design process. We had to consider not hitting the uh, heart walls as it could cause uh, heart failure, which is scary to work against, but that's the nature of the beast. However, this can compress into what would ultimately be a, I think we're working with a 24 millimeter diameter. Um, catheter that we'd be looking at right now on the four times scale would be scaled down to eight. And this, actually we're thinking, looking at smaller. The point is, this can be compressed using something called a vacuum tube, which goes over the device, really compresses it, and because all of this is really compliant, it really does get down to basically zero volume and allows for it to nicely slip in between a catheter and be inserted and removed uh, in a very safe fashion. Thank you, guys. <laughs>